So thank you very much for inviting me to come along to special, this special event actually. So it's really good to be here back in Maribor. So thanks, Alessandra, Ziga, etc. So um, I'm Guilhem Boddington and um, you've been seeing this slide for a while, but obviously I'm working as a creative director of a collective in London that is based in the east end of London in the tech city area. And I'm, that's called Body Data Space. And I'm going to talk today about um, our work and previous work of other collectives I've been in um, across the last 20 years or so, looking at the virtual and physical body and the, the future of that too. So it's a bit of a mixed input between looking at our history, what we've done before, looking at some of the processes we've been using across these years into the work and the practice, and then exploring a bit around what the future is for us all in relationship to virtual and physical, and what possibly are the problems that we've got to solve for the future, what are possibly the future perils, but also the positive futures of collaboration and cooperation. So, so it's a mixture of lots of slides, a mixture of um, art, industry stuff, business stuff, and some process stuff. So I hope it will be interesting for you all. So Body Data Space um, is a group of about 18 of us. We aren't all working full time in the project. We've got many jobs, but we're coming together with a focus on body and technology. And as I said, we're based in East London, which at the moment is the kind of core part of Britain for um, the development of this new creative industry sector that we're hearing so much about across Europe. So we've been working from the arts culture sector, but also kind of dipping our fingers in and out of this creative industry sector and seeing how does it link to what we've been doing across the years. And I hope some of the things I say today might give some ideas for that for the future. We also do quite a lot in education and we do a lot on the more futurology side. So been working a long time on um, multi-partner projects um, into Europe and elsewhere and actually worked with Keebler for a long time, since probably the late 90s, on various projects. And the last project being Robots and Avatars, which we did a few years ago with Alessandra here. Well, not actually at Keebler Portal, but in, uh, in the, uh, the, the, oh, the traditional, original Keebler building. And um, with education and debates as well. And we're also working a lot on women in technology and women in digital art, which has come out of the, the workshop at Keebler from two years ago, where we looked at women in relationship to working with robotics, virtual worlds, avatars, and, and access for girls coming into coding, etc. So I can talk more about that to, to anyone who's interested. So most of our work is coming from a very R&D, research and development process, experimental labs, workshops, and we put it out into public engagement quite fast, like they're prototypes that are put out there to test. And we're interested in large-scale public. So we're working a lot for the big, big public out there, the families, the festival goers, the, um, the person on the street. So we're t trying and testing some of these things into very fast from experimentation into more mass audiences. This is our uh, mission statement from Body Data Space. Just. This is a set of words, obviously, which actually, because quite a few of us are coming from a dance and performing arts background, many of these words have been relative to us in, um, in that sector for many, many years, always sensual, intuitive, haptic, kinetic, alive, physical. But also now today, of course, they're very relative to today's technologies and how we work with them. So I'm going to show how we cross those over. And this is what we mainly are working on at Body Data Space. We're working on this blend and we are what we say, we're looking at the body and data in virtual and physical space and this blend between live presence as our core human communication methodologies, telepresence, which is my actual specialization, um, avatars, robotics, both of them representations of ourselves in different worlds, um, wearable computing and sense and gesture tech. 
but we do really, really focus on the body at the centre of digital interaction and also on the natural interfaces of the body. So we really are interested in the live, sweating, living, emotional body. That's our kind of first, foremost con um, focus all the time. Um, and we're also really interested in immersion and collaborative share spaces, which is what I'm going to extend into in this talk, and looking at what our new literacy skills are for the 21st century and how our young people are coming into this new digital world with different kinds of skills, different need for literacy and different identity concepts as well. So, today's um, lecture, I, I'm going to talk about the move, the blend between moving from the physical to the digital, back to the physical, from the virtual to the physical, back to the virtual, this very fluid, blended world that we're all kind of beginning to be part of, and what that's got for us in positives and negatives. And so I'm particularly going to talk about collaborative share spaces, and look at our future digi digi bodiment, so how we will embody ourselves in digital terms and how we will work with that digital body. This work's coming from quite a long set of work for me. I've been working since the early 90s with um, telepresence and looking at the projected body and what it is, how we deal with ourselves and others. And this came from working with dance and video originally in the 80s and, um, and relating the relativity of ourselves to the projected body um, and taking that through into virtual realms, but how do we still maintain some kind of physical center in that, in that virtual physical world? And then actually with robots and avatars, these were um, three, of the, three of the many questions we were looking at in robots and avatars, but which felt very important for me. Um, what, we look at, what we look out there into the social political scene and how we deal with identity within these worlds and what are the behaviours and ethics within these new parallel worlds that we're dealing with, <clears throat> and actually what we can learn about collective collaboration and co-creation. So a few slides just on our history. Um, these are very early telepresence slides from doing workshops in various places around the world through the late 90s, early 2000s, um, trying out slightly crazy things like this middle one at the top here is looking, working with telepresence in heartbeat between two different studios in Arizona, actually. So, so being able to real-time shift heartbeat between the two spaces and different reactivities in bodies. Um, very different aesthetics, different projects in Lisbon, in London. These ones at the bottom are in Clubland. Actually, we were doing a lot between different clubs across Britain and youth clubs as well. We moved into doing some more kind of high-end projects around performances, a series called Skin Touch Feel, Always with full body. We're not working with the kind of waist up telepresence stuff at all. Looking at how we put skin on skin, how we actually push the body into the body through these mediated and distant, distant um, connectivity. So, so, you know, basically Skype wasn't around then, but we were basically doing like full body Skype and pushing that through. And as you can see, there's a lot of work in this is to do with camera and projection too. So it's a bit more like working on live TV really. So, this is in Shanghai with a project British Council where we were working to bring telepresence from outside the studio inside and vice versa. So how did we deal with the, the individual in a, a little flat in Shanghai and what could they possibly transmit of themselves and their ideas into the particularly big screens of Shanghai? So we we're just pushing experiments on that. And here working um, between London and Delhi and London and Lisbon, um, on what we call macro-micro, so the big body and the little body and how we deal with that within the... and extending our thinking about the senses, about sight and hearing in this case. Two bigger projects we've worked on, Future Physical, I will show some slides later of some of the commissions we did at this period, 2002 to 4, um, was a, a, a program of work, we did a big program in, uh, across about 60 different events in, in East England in the early 2000s. And then Robots and Avatars, which has been a very important set of work, looking at how young people will work with themselves and with the, the other at a distance through robotic, through representational forms of the body in virtual physical life across the next 10 to 15 years. And that project, as I mentioned, was an EU project with Keebler and with Alt Art in Romania. 
and a few slides of live performances working with avatars. This one actually, she's working with iPhone and her own body image here and playing with this in Dare We Do It Real Time at the Connecticut Art Fair. And this um, uh, next one is working with a live avatar made by um, Ivo Dioski from um, Prague. And he's working real time with the dancer here in the avatar playfully. So, and education work. Um, here actually teaching young people soft and hard skills around working with technology. So the hard skills of video, of the communication through the technology interface of the, the telepresence, um, the streaming skills, the tech side of it, but also soft skills like collaboration, negotiation, how to work in teams across distance, um, all that area of um, co-creation side. And here with young professionals, I actually think this is um, at Keebler, actually, with Marco Donamora, um, 2012, working with biosensors and body sensors, and at Altar, working in Romania with um, young choreographers um, with Connect, motion capture, and telepresence convergence. So, and all the time with this telepresence stuff, what we're really interested in is the real-time live body and how that that connectivity across the world can start to become more intimate and more more in a, an area of intuition and trust as, a, as it is when we're here together and having eye-to-eye -eye contact. So we are looking at the gestural interface, we're looking at the behaviours within that, we're looking at how we navigate and orientate ourselves through these virtual spaces from the physical. It's quite bizarre in your head when you're doing it. Um, but the aim is actually about collaboration in this physical virtual blended space in a way to be as more, as, as based on presence as possible. One of the processes that we've used for many years, actually, is a very simple thinking, which is actually just that when we're making work, we always work on this with this weave, this weave between the body, the technologies, and the content. So like making a plait, you've got to plait and braid it, and all three strands have to be done at the same time, equally pulled together in a straight line. You can't let one go ahead of the other. You can't let one just drop out, or you haven't got the strength of that rope or that braid that comes through. And we're putting the body at the center of that. And that's, this is a process, very simple process that we've held on to since the mid nineties, which come through workshopping, etc. And that actually has been the core of our collective process too. So we've always been working in collectives. We work with inter-authorship in the nineties. Now today it's more called shared ownership. So looking at actually how we make ideas together not me on my own telling everybody what to do, but actually the whole group involved in the creative process, how you work with that open innovation, how you create an emergent dynamic from it, what, what comes through this kind of group um, dynamics and how we can create together across many disciplines. So not getting caught in our own sectors too much, but trying to find the ways to um, create languages between us. Um, and between the technologists and the, and the live artists particularly. So, and again, you know, just to emphasize this essence of liveness that we really are focusing on always. What I learned when I was doing my performing arts training is very much, you know, this live presence about actually the breath, the heartbeat, the intimacy that we can create, the, the presence and absence of you when you're when you're when you're there in front of an audience when you've gone the memory that remains of an audience beyond the event itself and looking at that in relationship to the participant i.e. the person involved whether it's a performer performer or a user of that in that live environment in carnival or in in um, street theatres etc and also the person that's a spectator or an observer Today, of course, our focus is much more on the technology in the body side. So this slide, actually, the hypersensory self, is about actually extending and enhancing what comes from our bodies and what we can use out now with digital technologies. And obviously, for many years, we've been dealing with audio and visual through cameras, through CD Walkmans, etc. And locational and proximity are now in our, our smart mobiles with us all the time with GPS systems, etc. And we're very becoming much more reliant on those in cities when we're moving around and traveling. Um, and in body data space, we're really focusing much more in this area of haptic, field touch, the kinesthetic, the biofeedback area, 
the proprioceptic and the motion capture. And we're working a lot with gesture interaction. But there's other artists I know who are focusing on smell and taste now, and that the beginning of that starting to be digitally transferable. And, and so this is all about the data that can come from us and actually what can happen with that in other spaces and how it can return to us. And this is important in relationship to looking at real-time work because what we're trying to do in a way is put these two slides together. So we're trying to get the liveness and the hypersensory to work together on top of each other. And these are complex layers of interaction. And this, I think, is where a lot of very interesting experimentation is happening in the art sector today, um, with people pushing these edges. And there's some examples of that within this exhibition. So it's really great. Last night, I haven't looked at everything in detail yet, but even these, these wonderful pods with the audio surround sound is, is pushing that actual what we physically feel from that sound and how we're immersed within that sound. So there we're taking the audio and we're taking our own locational and our own sense of being and, and placing ourselves in the liveness of it. So all this, of course, today comes into, this is the same slide down in this far corner. We, we put ourselves in the middle of a collaborative share space with this. There's many other people who have this data coming from them. It leaves our bodies in many different ways. And we share that. We share that into an architecture, which is a kind of I, we space, where we can share it just with two or three others if we want. We can, say, have a medical data that we don't want to share with everybody, but we share with our husband, our family, and maybe a medical research environment. Or we put it out there to share with everybody in the whole world. Or we have a selected group, like in Facebook, where you share pictures with friends that you've ticked. So this collaborative share space that I've mentioned a few times is in existence at the moment in many forms. And Facebook is a good example. But it's actually, where does that go in the future? What does that offer us in collaboration and co-creation possibilities? How does it extend itself in a way which becomes much more complementary to us as live living beings, yeah? We share there now today, we share knowledge and skills and beliefs and ideas. And actually, what we want to do is to see how transformative this space can be. What, how can it enhance us as humans? How can it extend our connectivity across the world, our understanding of each other, our intercultural understanding? What could this do to solve some of the problems out there in the world? So, and does it enable an enhanced capacity for innovation to happen as we can work with people in many different places? The little note at the bottom, of course, you'll all understand is that you can't, you can't flaneur in this space. You can't like stand on the edges and observe this collaborative share space. You've got to get in there and do it to be able to understand it. And you've got to push yourself to, to go there and to explore the corners of it and try different things. And I mention that because we get a lot of professors who always want to come and document and observe our work and we always say you can't observe it you've got to go in there and do it yeah so now the people that do understand this collaborative share space of course is young people so you know anyone and I'm sure you do all have either kids or nie nieces and nephews or young people around you who are using this collaborative share space with no problem at all they understand they understand that they are one of millions I didn't understand that when I was 10. I saw myself as one of my, one of, you know, 60 or 80 in my classes, maybe 600 in my big school. But most 10 year olds today, they're very aware. They are one of millions in the world and they, they want to be and belong in very diverse ways. And they can be and belong in diverse communities, which they choose and those shared spaces like Facebook. <clears throat> they also know they're all creatives. There's no more, you know, well, he was born an artist and he wasn't, or she was, she's really artistic and he's not. Everybody has a chance to be creative. And the mine, Minecraft um, story is a really easy example of that. Minecraft, does everybody know Minecraft? I'm sure you do. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, so, sorry. I can't quite hear everyone actually. So if there is questions, do do just put your hand up and I'll come forward. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so this is actually a Minecraft quote: "Is we are the story," and that's how those young people go into it. We've I've got two stepsons, ten and fourteen, who are in there all the time, making their worlds and working with their friends, videoing themselves, of course, and resharing that out again. 
watching videos of people working in Minecraft. It's a whole distributed platform of sharing and learning. And we also, they do know that they're very much part of this conversational flow, that they move between physically chatting with their friends in school, they leave school, they get on the bus and they WhatsApp them straight away. And there isn't really very much difference between those two things for them. They don't see a line between them. It's a continued conversation and a knowledge transfer. <clears throat> They also have many digital identities already, and I'm going to go further on that and look at avatars a bit further. And they're very aware of the virtual physical, very able in Skype. We know, particularly for families who've got people working in different places around the world. I mean, I've actually been working in Estonia and Latvia last year, and there, the number of people using Skype, because either dad or mum is working elsewhere quite a lot, so is incredible. So you just see it everywhere. So it's really, I think, very special that that blendedness is coming through as a very natural way for young people. But we do need to make sure that those worlds are positive for them and how they can use them. This is a quick slide actually showing some colleagues of ours in London who do a project called Printcraft where you can go into mine, Minecraft, you make a, 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 an object, a house, a, a temple or whatever, you take it to a certain area in Minecraft, you leave it there in a little data envelope, they pick it up, and they print it out for you and they send it you in the post. So this is, a, 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 for me, one of those good examples of the virtual to the physical. So now I want to go on to one of my key, key concern areas, and this is a dichotomy that we are living in today, which is a dichotomy of need between being mobile and yet wanting to be immersed in these different worlds alongside our real world. And I think this dichotomy is where, in a way, the digital arts and experimental research area can really push some edges. And some things in this exhibition are already pushing that edge on actually, what is immersion? How do we actually create immersive environments where we are physically immersed, which potentially also could be mobile? We carry around our mobiles with us. Some mobiles have these little projectors that you can do, which you can share with three or four people on a little wall. But in majority, mobiles are very eye tools. You look at them on your own. Yes, you're receiving stuff from everywhere, but they're for you, yeah. But we are, and you know, particularly in this particular environment, we're, you know, obviously very interested in the going into the immersive environment where we can move things around us, where we've got that information surrounding us. So how do we start to put this together in the future? Now, I like this slide because this is an old picture of a mobile immersion. But again, it's a bit like looking at the mobile telephone. Everybody's on the train. They're all reading their own newspaper. The one thing, of course, they did do was leave them on the seats, which they still do, and then the next person gets it. So it's still a shared medium as such. But I think this isn't a new problem. And I think this is why, you know, we're just using new technologies and we're just dealing with it in different ways. So we know that there's been some amazing work done on immersion across the years in many countries by amazing groups. And I've just named here three, um, three groups, three or four groups, Defuse, who I think is very well known across the world, who have been working in this area of trying to create immersive information and, and shared knowledge through sound and audiovisuals for many years in different ways. And Anti-VJ with their mapping techniques onto buildings and UVA with their um, specialist softwares and LEDs and, and then Umbrellium with their sensors and their Internet of Things connectivities. And, and I know that you've probably got four or five examples in Slovenia. Every country's got four or five examples of these amazing artists that have been pushing the edges of immersion for bigger crowds of people in different ways. And actually, going back to Future Physical, I'm looking back at that program now, we worked on some amazing projects then. There was this fantastic 3D installation called Mersey Circles, which was real-time information coming from an island just off the coast, um, by, near London, actually, sending data into a 3D environment that you could navigate through by Masaki Fujihata. And um, a great biofeedback piece where you were using your breath and heartbeat, you made a, a sound and visual around yourself, which was yours, but you could actually then plug in through the wearables to the person next to you and share that sonification visualization. That was Tekla Shripost and Susan Gazelle. And then also these fantastic, this, this one, a big, big um, circus space, which was filled with motion sensors and um, 
with wearables and you went into it and you went on the, on the swings, etc. And that's took Zoom and, um, Foam, who are based in Belgium, still doing great work, all these people. So, and in the more, um, education sector and the ecology sector and the festival sector, immersion's become quite a, a thing in the last few years. We're back in an era where domes are being built. You know, some of them are mobile, which is great. So, these plastic domes that move around. I mean, this one here is an educational dome which moves around India that classrooms can go into and they can see, they do astrology or they do geography on these, on these ceilings. They lie inside them and get their information. And the bottom one here is Sat in uh, Montreal, who I know is a, a partner with Keepless on some projects. And the, the Society for Artists and Technologists been going many years and very recently, I think two years ago, they finally got their new building with this incredible 360 degree dome theatre, which now they are commissioning artists from all over the world to make these wonderful immersive pieces for. So it's happening out there in different ways. And there's also smaller ones, these little inflatable immersive environments that are moving around. So these are artists and, 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 and creative industries and architects um, who are creating environments which can blow up and be put away again and which are going to festivals. And this one is for three people to put their heads into the middle for sound scores and visuals. That goes round into the different music festivals. So um, so we are seeing the beginning of this mobile immersion through domes, etc. Some of them are fixed, they're big buildings, but more and more mobile ones with different plastic polymers being used for different buildings. Um, and we also are starting to see us move through into mobility and immersion through wearables. So this is the next section, is looking at this whole area of wearables. And that, again, I wanted to point out here, this is Google Glass, 2012. But I wanted to show the actual route of Google Glass, because I think this is really important about artists and artists at the beginning of some of these movements, that Steve Mann, who is based in Toronto, an artist based in Toronto, has been working on this eyepiece glass thing for many, many years. And in fact, he spoke at Future Physical in 2002, and he had this, 90, by 1999, this middle picture here, he was wearing this pretty much full time. And actually by, I think, 2002, had 20 students in Toronto University also wandering around together on campus, all wearing these eyeglasses and exchanging imagery and doing various different experiments with them. And, um, and there's a clear acknowledgement in the press, actually, definitely in the UK, that he has been a kind of the lead through into this whole Google Glass idea, the wearable that moves with you, that gives you what you need, that gives you real time, constant process. And now we're seeing artists start to work with that process and how their process becomes absolutely upfront. It becomes as imperative as the art, the end piece itself. Sometimes interesting, sometimes not, but still really interesting to go through that. We're seeing these um, wearable eyewear coming out now into many different areas. So we know that Oculus Rift, which was developed to work with things like Second Life, has now been bought by Facebook. And these are important things, I think, for us to hold on to. In the art world, too, we need to see what these... What is Facebook going to do with Oculus Rift yet? Yeah. How will they start to use this type of technology when we face Facebook as a web technology and Oculus Rift is a virtual world technology, which, which you go into a new avatar. So we can see, that's quite clear, Facebook will move towards an avatar virtual world environment in the future, yeah. But Oculus Rift and the Project Morphous, which is a Sony project, which actually is probably more interesting because it's got much more um, head tracking and um, 360 degrees rotation, um, they're still eye technologies. They cut you off from the physical world. You know, you put on the glasses and there you are, you're cut off from everyone else. You're actually there. I've done Oculus Rift, you're very, it's amazing, but you know, you're there in that space and you're not aware who else is around you. So this is a project from some students at the, um, the Royal College of Art, Art and the Imperial College in London. And this is a, a, a wearable glasses which is 3D printed, so very easy to make, and which actually has sensors that take your breathing from the cheek, the, the mouth one, and also take your pupil size. And through those two biofeedback methodologies, they can, um, it can help when you're reading on the web or reading a book, things, it, it can tell the things that you're most interested in. And it can mark those up, or bookmark them for you. Through your pupil size, through the change in your breath, it actually 
automatically pulls out of texts and web pages the things that interest you the most. So there's something that's maybe a little bit more directly linked into our systems, but it's still something on your face, which has got to go with you everywhere. And we've seen the development of gloves, and um, this is Imogen Heap with her new gestural music wear, which she does amazing stuff with, which is going onto the market for everyone to use. These gloves, as you move, you can play the orchestra here, the drums are here, you can do dynamics. It's very, actually, very gestural, very beautiful in choreographic terms. Um, at the bottom, this is the lady glove, which was actually 1991 Arts Electronica, which was basically working on the same ideas much earlier using Max MSP. And that was um, supported by Stein Studios. So again, the direct artist route through to some of these wearables. And we've got biofeedback through the wristbands, through jawbone, and many, many others, fit bands that everyone's running around with, and also obviously the new iWatch, which will be a which is a big controller, which we can use to control stage lighting and sound just from the side of the room, yeah. So these are things where we will be able to, from our bodies, control data and make what we want go back and forward to us. We can. But do we really want this wearable world? Are we really going to all be covered in wearables from, <laughs> from the moment we're born? You know, are we going to strap the Google Glass on? Are we going to strap the wristlets on and the hand gloves? These are additionalities to the body. And uh, for us, they're very much about that breaking the natural interface and actually you know, we, we've got we've got a great body. You know, we, this has evolved in this way for various reasons. And so how do we get to a point where we don't need to add to ourselves to actually have this data transfer in and out from ourselves? So obviously what I'm looking at here in immersion and mobility links into the Beam Me Up Scotty dream from the Star Trek era. So here we are in the, in the holodeck dream of the future, yeah. This is maybe I was born in '62, very much brought up in this era. You know, I'm I'm not ashamed to say this has been in my head for many years, and I genuinely did think that in the year 2000 we would be doing this. I gave up on that probably in the early 80s, and that's possibly why I work with telepresence because it's the next best thing. But we know, you know, actually, I mean, somebody said to me the other day about the iPads in Star Trek. You know, these they all walk around with these little tablets, and you know, there's the iPad idea coming through. So sci-fi and art's very much influencing these next, next generations. So holograms, of course, are happening, and they're expensive still. So we don't see so many in the arts. These two are um, actually, this is in the big music industry, so this was Warren G when he was absolutely stunned on stage by the appearance of, of Dr. Dre and Snoopy Dogg. When they were together, and it was Tupac Shakur came on stage as a hologram, who is dead, and he came on stage with them. Gave me chills, he told MTV. It was like, whoa, whoa. Because it looked like him, it talked like him, it moved like him, it's just like, damn, it was a trip, yeah. So, and again here, this was a, a reproduction of Paul Arden, who was the creative director of Saatchi and Saatchi, and he passed away in 2008, but for their 50th birthday party, I think it was 2011, he came on stage. They reproduced him as a hologram. He did a speech to the whole of Saatchi's, which they pieced together through thousands of tiny video clips of him doing many speeches across his life on video. And his family didn't even know that was going to happen. They were just like burst into tears in the front row. Very, very emotive thing, of course. You know, the, the resurrection of the dead. Yeah, so in a sense, in these two examples. Holograms have been used in opera a lot, and it's really worthwhile keeping an eye on them. Big operas. We need money to do this, and we need to be able to start to work with this. So what we do do is work with telepresence robots. Um, this is, these are industry examples. So these are, this is Beam, which is used in a lot of industries now, around between the tech industries around the world. This middle one, of course, is Edward Snowden, who's in Moscow, and actually spends his 20, 20 hours a day in telepresence robots in different offices around the world, press offices, activist offices, etc. So... You know, Edward Snowden may have become the, the first person to spend more time as a telepresent robot than anyone else due to the nature of his situation. So, um, sad, or at least he's with, with, with been able to work onwards, yeah. These ones are in hospitals, um, and in old people's homes. This is a, a robot which does a kidney punch when someone, um, falls down. But it's a, it's a real person that's knowing that that person's fallen down and they may be, you no, know, in a different building, this is, you know, whatever. So 
in offices, Gostai Jazz Robot, these little robot faces with a little face on them, but I think really importantly in schools. And actually for students who are either disabled, can't come to school, or in hospital for like three months, and actually do remain within their classroom as a telepresence robot, and continue their lessons and cross over with everyone. And I like this picture because obviously they just become part of the playground. They become part of the corridor and they're there with, because they can move around. They're not just stuck on a screen in this classroom. They're actually mobile into the corridors or out with the kids. So, and in artist terms, there is some really beautiful work going on with telepresence robotics and actually how the face becomes this thing that we, we so watch and communicate with and what our live presence comes from. So, these are, this is Maskbot, which is um, Munich University, um, Technical University in Australia working together to beam powerfully 3D image of, of a face onto the back of a transparent mask rather than onto this flat screen robot um, image. And this is Anna, Dimitri and Alex May who are part of Robots and Avatars. And theirs is more of a, it's linked to Connect. So actually when you look at the robot face, morphs your face into it so it becomes more of about a familiarity to actually feel okay about that robot um, and that's why it's called robot companion they're looking at that sociable mixed side of robotics and telepresence and then of course here at Keebler when we did robots and avatars we had the little navi two little ones running around the galleries <laughs> which we could control we did it in London on some Skype and we had these little controllers and we could move the robot around and look at the gallery at any time go behind the bar say hello to Alessandra or whatever and also you know this now is happening in lots of places the V&A have got them in the night time the National Gallery is doing them robots at night in galleries robots in the daytime so you can take your friend who can't travel with you for whatever reason to visit that exhibition, etc. So, so that's um, looking at how we can be mobile as beings in that digi bodyment side, but it's still through telepresence and mobility, but it's still caught into this world of, of we're still not really physical, we're the robot within it. So, looking at avatars. It's a different thing. We do re-embody ourselves as avatars. We are reincarnated um, through the, this, this word avatar means reincarnation. It's one of the ten, ten avatars of Vishnu, which is incarnation, appearance, manifestation. Of course, the film avatars helped massively understand this area from ma on a mass level. People understand what an avatar is now and how it is the other you in a virtual world, which is still you, yeah. And we know it in our gaming. This is Michael Takema Gruder, who is here with Robots and Avatars last year. This is his Second Life avatar, his Wii avatar, and his Sony PlayStation avatar. Michael's a bit obsessed with getting his avatar to look as exactly like him as possible, which is great. Mine don't look like me. And, and people, there's a very interesting debate there always on the psychology of that. But we're taking this work into um, schools all over the place, looking at... Um, how you make an avatar in a virtual world, what, how you represent yourself, what do you look like in that world, Is it if it's a work world or a social world or whatever. Um, particularly with working with Women's Shift Digital in the girls' groups, yeah, actually um, in, in London working with young Muslim girls, etc. here, how they choose to represent themselves is really interesting. They, they will, you know, suddenly give themselves very large boobs and they've got very short skirts on, which they can't do at home. And then you have this whole debate about the identity that they're putting out there, what they're saying about themselves out there in that virtual world and how they need to really realize that if this is a work virtual world in the future, they can't do that. And they've got to be careful about their behaviors and ethics in those virtual worlds are no different than in real world at this point. So as we know, there's so much you know, anonymous trolling and pullback coming in from virtual environments. And this is Vision of Our Communal Dreams here at Keebler, which was the beautiful virtual world, which actually was added into by several educational projects, including working here with um, 10 or 12 artists and um, technicians who extended the world while it was here. And here, this has got avatar entry. You can enter as an avatar, whether you were at Keebler or whether you were in a different part of the world. You could enter it through telepresence, and you could enter it through Twitter by tweeting butterfly or flowers, etc., and they would grow within that world. So it's about creating a virtual world which you have a physical conversation with. 
which has got many routes into it through different platforms into that central virtual world, which allows that physical virtual interface to be very flu fluid, very able. This is a commercial product, an uh, alter game, but based on a group of people who are coming from theatre background, they do this for um, large-scale companies. They're called virtual training grounds. There's lots of them out there, but I like this one because they've got very good um, theatre philosophy behind it in their collaboration terms. They go into companies and they set up the staff. Um, everyone gets an avatar. They go into this gallery world, actually, and the the, they can pre-put in images to look at in the gallery walls in the, around them, and they chat and discuss them, and they use a problem-solving method, which they then bring out of the virtual world and redo in groups, talking through staff problems in commercial companies or creative industries. And here we are with the future avatar. This is an old picture, actually, but it is about the avatar shaped by the future, by psychological physiological and demographic information which we will and are starting to put into our avatars. So information about your education, your geographical location of course, your sex, your age, your IQ, you know, your social economic class, your occupation, your marital status relationship, a lot of this already goes on Facebook. So our identity data but how are we starting to put that into avatars and potentially use that data in different avatars, in different data attached to different avatars in different virtual worlds? <clears throat> and what, are the, what we've got to be careful about there and how we need to use that carefully? <clears throat> at the moment in my um, university research, I'm really looking at the avatar and the demon and in history and actually how this attachment to the other us has, isn't a new idea at all. In, and, and, you know, we, we can look at the Avatar and Vishnu, but there's also some amazing discussion and ideas that have come through painting, writing, etc., across many cultures around the, the attached other, whether it's in an animal form, like here, the portrait of a lady with a squirrel and a starling. This came through in Philip Pullman in the book, the Golden Compass film and books, which may, some of you may know, the demon, which is attached to you. It's, you know, when they, when they go to cut these demons off them, Nicole Kidman is the, the evil, evil woman for trying to dissect or cut the demon away from the children. And um, a bit like trying to take a mobile away from a teenager or something, you know, it's just not okay. And, um, and also, um, and this is a National Theatre version actually of this with puppets working as a demon, you know. So, and also in many mythologies, from the Greeks, the Norse mythologies, to Jungian anima, to looking at all these areas, there's always been this debate about the other which is you and how it goes out beyond you and comes back to you with messages or how it represents you in different places or what it gives you in your life yeah <clears throat> even as simply as the inner voice yeah where does your inner voice come from is it another you is it how do we see this in ourselves so I'm really interested in how potentially our future avatar or avatars and I think we will have several will be this other us and how we push it away from us to represent us, pull it back to us and what that means to the future. So moving on, because part of that I think is about staying natural and really quite obsessed with not having to have these wearables on us, but still being able to use the natural interface of the body. So this fast movement through in gesture tech is really exciting. So using things like Connect, which we use in a lot of our projects, using these new biosense and um, things that are coming out. Wrist Myo is one of them. On your arm, reacts to your muscles. You can even fly a drone with it. You know, kids can move their car, those little electronic cars. No more handset things like this, but just like this, moving them around. What is it that gesture tech can do to actually enable us to be a little bit more um, fluid and normal in our bodies without wires? without wearables too much. And gesture systems we use all the time. Unbelievable amount. And I think just going through this again, is like how many different gesture systems are in everyday use, whether it's on the aeroplane when you're being told, you know, you've got to put your, how to do the emergency systems, um, whether it's in dance, mime and music, whether they're in most forms, and particularly in things like ballet and catacali, the literal gestural forms, um, sports, referee gestures, um, spectator gestures like the Mexican wave, special needs communications and sign languages to the deaf, which I'll show some work from later, and gaming, of course, these signifier gestures that are coming from this. So 
Health and safety is a huge area in surgery, in military, in any emergency site. They will be working with gesture or communication because there may well be too much noise and too much, you know, going on to actually be able to work with each other. 9-11, they use the masses of gestures through all of the, the emergency services people to each other. And gestures have become, you know, this is um, Katniss from um, Hunger Games, and this is the gesture that she used in Hunger Games to show, you know, the unification with everyone out there in that terrible world that she was stuck in, but was being transmitted from real time all the time. How many of you have watched Hunger Games and seen Hunger Games? Yeah, so this gesture actually has become a gesture in use by quite a few young revolutionaries and, and rebels around the world because it's become a unification gesture. So a very important, if you haven't seen Hunger Games or read it, read it. It's quite a terrible series but of, of books, but very important, I think, in this terms of virtual blended, virtual physical blending and how it's seen. Children's series, and like the Philip Pullman one, children's series are very important. So, So <clears throat> just to go back to our own work a bit. This is more recent work we've been doing. This is a piece called Ring the Changes, where we've been working with a deaf choreographer called Shisatu Minamanura, and she wanted to start to see sounds, and she wanted a non-hearing audience and a hearing audience to both get an amazing experience with an audiovisual work. And so here we work with um, Nick Rothwell, creating a, a generative real-time software system, which actually picks up data from the breath, the voice, and the motion the slapping and the feet motions of the dancers. Quite simple, actually. Five routes of sound data coming into the algorithms, <clears throat> creating quite clear visuals of reactive seeing sound, which morphed and mutated as it went. And um, in the piece, there was two hearing dancers and one partially deaf dancer. So we're working with an audience, mixed audience too. Very interesting. We just premiered this in September at the South Bank. Um, still going through evaluations on it. But what was really amazing was it, it was a very immersive piece of work, both in sound terms for the hearing audience. We used some quite intense physical sound techniques to push us to think again about hearing, but also in these visual terms and this sound visual reactivity for the non-hearing audience. Um, <clears throat> this is a piece called um, well, by Umbrellium, which was part of the Digital Revolution exhibition at the Barbican. These are close colleagues of ours, so I did user testing on this piece. And these are amazing lasers that you can pull around you. You've just got a straight laser coming at you. You can just play with it with your hands and gesture and draw with it. Pull it around you like, like waves of cloth coming around you. So probably the nearest to a kind of beam me up image and feeling of, and, but also a kind of, a, invis like a, a, a light cloak coming all around you and being there in that space. So. And on to a piece called Me and My Shadow, which is a piece we made a couple of years ago, which is still in variation, various iterations coming through. This is a collaboration between um, several artists, myself, Joe Hyde, Phil Tu, and a quite a big team. Um, it was an EU project again. And it converges for four of the areas I've been talking about. It's a convergence of telepresence, human gestures, a virtual world to hold it all in, and motion capture. So particularly, we were we were converging telepresence motion capture technologies, and then bringing into that, there is nothing on your body. You don't wear anything at all. You go into it and you do it. You're immediately an avatar in a big virtual world which is shared. So I'm just gonna show a bit of video of this, which is sound, please. It's a virtual reality world. You're interacting with other people in other countries. Amazing. I met a few um, people from France, which which have orange characters. So you kind of like see a red person with a vapor trail and pulsing around them, and you know that that's the that's the person over in Paris. And people with purple avatars are from London, which I had. It was quite surreal. It was like in a different world. It's really amazing, like in a dream sometimes. And people with green avatars were from Brussels, and people with blue avatars were from Istanbul. 
I find it amazing. It's quite relaxing and absolutely addictive. So you're really communicating with each other by just being in the same space and you know mimicking the moves with each other and it's just really rewarding to feel like you're in this virtual space but they're actually on the other side of the English Channel. For me the great great thing was the movement was to just play with the movement and move move the space around to see the moon and the stars. I actually met someone else from another, uh, I think it was Paris. So they came right close and I thought, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a cool moment. Yeah, I was dancing with them and, and, what, and I tried to copy them and see what they were doing. It, it has all the ingredients that people love about self-expression. enough there but just um basically me and my shadow is a collaborative share space um that was a dream we had for many years and we could only make it when connect appeared because we really wanted to do this without attachments to the body different we've worked with motion capture for many years but it's always been with these gear you know gypsy motion capture suits and big wearables you know we also wanted to do it in a way that many people could take part. So about that was um, in London at National Theatre as our partner. And um, we worked between Paris, London, Istanbul and Brussels, as it said. About 10,000 people did this across a two-week period. Um, and we got a lot of feedback, as you were seeing through some of the comments there. Um, what we call, you know, qualitative feedback through Vox Pops and, and comments. We also were able to gather qualitative, quantitative data about where people were moving in this virtual world, how they encountered each other, what were the best moments, how people got lost, where they were losing, not getting it, you know, etc. So today now we're working forward on this project um, in various variations. One, to get it out of the box, because we need to do it in much like space like this size and to enable everybody to be involved in it and secondly for what uses it has for education for health and well-being for actually even industry we have a lot of interest from creative industry side still 10 years off but this type of full-bodied physical virtual collaborative share space is obviously potentially where the oculus rift facebook relationship hints at yeah but without the gear without the wearables on it so so that is our learning space. How do, how do we learn in this space? What can we do with this space? How do we actually start to create transformation in global terms and be able to co-express and, and co-participate? And can this kind of space enable us to go towards a much more um, enhanced capacity for innovation? And I think probably my key point to leave, finish with is I really believe that we need to keep artists at the at the absolute center of this type of um, experimentation and developments through and I've tried to show that through showing Steve Mann and various artists and how they've led towards these bigger mass things that we see coming out now like Google Glass yeah um, so the the design side of this and the user experience and the the actual the the, the ability to think beyond the norm, yeah, is actually what, what artists and creative technologists 
are capable of doing. And I think it's exhibitions like this that really show where those things are pointing to for the future. And talking to Ziga actually earlier, for me, I haven't looked at everything in big detail yet, but I absolutely love the room, which is by Raum Trick Pirate Pirates. Yeah. For me, that's a wonderful immersion space because there you are. It's immediately immersive when you go in. It's a beautiful sculptural object in its own right. It's, it, it's, it's not a set of projectors and connects sticking out all over the room. It, it's something to look at and to work out and to see where your immersion is coming from. And to create that kind of space and have that linked up to many other spaces like it around the world and share those kind of environments, textiles, feelings, and create those emotions together, I think is a very positive, positive um, point forward from this type of installation in this type of exhibition. So, okay, thank you very much. Gilan, thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions, there is a 10 minute Q&A. So. So to, um, I can, sh if, if you're interested, I can show um, a slide which is looking more at the perils of this type of stuff, but oh, I can also talk to people you'd like to see, yeah? Because I didn't actually show, get to that slide. Um, am I still on screen? Yeah. Great. So yeah, I mentioned this at the beginning, but... Um, Obviously, we've got a lot of myths and fears that have been debunked by a lot of these new technologies. So we know now we're not going to have the obsolete body, brain only, attached to the computer, which actually probably most of us here always knew wasn't ever going to happen because we're physical people and we're working on that physical side. But that kind of press whoa, about, oh no, you know, kids will just become total blobs sitting at computers is potentially out the window if we move towards much more physical-based technology interfaces, as I've been showing, like with motion capture. And also loss of social interaction and community hasn't proved to be a true thing. In fact, many people who are very isolated, either through where they lived or through living on their own or being elderly or whatever or, or disabled, are now much more parts of communities and much more part of belonging and linking into places. And I think even the iPad and tablets has enabled that on a mass level. And we're seeing in Britain now, and we, and we know we're talking here about developed world, and there's still many, many people who are still not using any of these technologies at all. But actually, we will see a rollout across Europe in the next 10 years of the tablet in the home being used for doctor's appointments, telepresence, doctor's appointments for, obviously, all your friends' connectivities and your community links are happening anyway. My mum does everything. She's, she's got Parkinson's, and she's utterly, her whole world happens through her iPad, and she's very... She's a Greenpeace activist. She's on Facebook with loads of people. There's lots happening. So, um, loss of creativity and loss of, um, I don't think will happen. I think we're seeing creativity come through for all. But what we do need to explore really is this I and we within this, these environments. So actually the peril of losing yourself in the crowd, of following the crowd. Yeah. Of being too like, oh, that's how everyone does it. So I must do it. We know that is potentially quite dangerous overall. And our personal identity data I talked about a bit. I think we need to be much, much, much more savvy about what we give out there and how we give it and who we give it to. And there is some small companies starting in Britain now where you can log all your personal identity data and you can, and anyone that wants to use it has to go through that company for your permission of what parts of your data they use. And if it's a supermarket, then you can charge them. It might be, you know, one euro, or whatever, or you can say no. Yeah, so another one, of course, is um, thought control and puppeteering and this whole biometrics data attack stuff. So these areas, we, I'm sure, you know, there's coming into this exhibition in various ways and we're keeping an eye on. And, of course, just as much as we can look at joy and beauty through these immersive environments, they can be used for torture too because any kind of body feedback which is data from us and back to us in different ways. If by touch, you know, we actually receive data back, which gives us a shock, 
and we're getting that constantly, then we're in the torture environment, which is, you know, well tested out and probably quite advanced.